Welcome to Sea Italia TV. We are at Ojica Hotel and here we have Marco Soriano talking about the economy in the world today. The fundamental structure of the world economy is changing. While the contribution of services to global output is on the rise, investment and productivity remain stagnant. Savings keep accumulating and growth and inflation decline. Meanwhile, globalization has increased codependence. A rising number of countries can influence the world's economic performance and its financial stability. Yet, the international monetary system is neither fostering an efficient allocation of global capital nor preventing currency volatility. Is the fundamental structure of the world economy changing? Yes, the global economy is undergoing a long-term structural transformation. Um, we have to understand that first, in the past 30 years, the contribution of key factors, key sectors to global output shifted. This is very important. Agriculture fell, manufacturing declined, and services rose as shares of global value added and employment. Number two, capital expenditures are also declining. For example, in services, we're looking at tech, digital companies that still need little investment to be able to prosper. Another example would be the fast-growing sharing economy by relying on today's internet. Cheaply interfaces fast supply systems where the costs are with a large number of customers, most likely the demand where the money is, which basically, in other words, we can say that by inexpensively putting underutilized resources to use, it creates value with very little capital. As a result, and this is probably the most important part, global net investment, gross investment minus depreciation, that is, as a share of total capital stock, is close to about its lowest level since Second World War, and this is bad. Number three. Demographically speaking, the trends support a decline in investment and consumption. Why? Because A, falling birth rates and a rising life expectancy are leading to aging populations, especially in developed markets, or what we call DMs. B, as the pool of working age, 15 to 64 years old individuals, shrinks in both DMs and emerging markets, firms deploy less capital because there are fewer workers to hire. And finally, this labor force that were anticipated to participate in terms of rate decline and consumers refrain from spending. So this is our issue. Why is productivity low and savings keep rising? It's a very good question. So the productivity boost of the new economy today, the post-manufacturing service-based economic system is lower than in past industrial revolutions. After the 2008 financial crisis, as you know, labor productivity growth fell across sectors in most OECD countries where 45 million workers are jobless. At the same time, technological progress and business automation or automation are making white collar jobs redundant Traditional middle class jobs have disappeared, but savings keep on growing. And this is actually interesting. Why? Because the inequality rises at higher, higher share of income goes to richer individuals with higher propensity to save. Also, since 2008, emerging markets have accumulated massive foreign exchange reserves. And the world's main central banks also known as CBs, nearly double from about $10 trillion to $18.2 trillion. Their combined balance sheets are just scary. Number three on this, on this question, the corporations relentlessly accumulate retained earnings, which means that this rising supply of savings is rather unresponsive to interest rates cuts, which is today's political uh, rhetoric, uh, CB policy rates do not boost spending. As a result, and despite historically low interest rates, economic growth stagnates along with inflation. So how do we, how can we see this in a macroeconomic view? In many economies, with short-term interest rates close to zero and declining prices, 
Achieving full employment becomes a real challenge. In line with the secular stagnation hypothesis, negative real interest rates might be needed to equate saving and investment with full employment. Has globalization increased codependence and systematic risks? This is a very technical question, so once again, the answer to this, admittedly, I have to say, is a yes. Rapid cross-border economic, social technological exchange have enhanced these interconnections. And what happens in result, as a consequence, is increased resilience, but also fragility. Capital has become an often unpredictable driving force more influential and systemic than actual trading. The, the good example would be the foreign exchange market, where, which have grown to be the world's largest market with an average daily trading volume of about, or in excess of $4 trillion in bio -macro financial linkages. 25 economies, because of this size and connections with other countries, can have a very strong systemic impact on the performance of the global economy and its financial stability. This is the problem that we're seeing today. So what do we need? We need regular monitoring. As the scale of financial flows and their volatility goes up in a context of lower growth and higher uncertainty, we, we must examine the economic interdependence and increase the risk rather than diminishing the risk. And obviously this is going to result in financial crisis because they become more and more recurrent. For example, the, the sudden unwinding of global imbalances that we saw. Number four on this would be anything that had to do with crisis transmission mechanisms. As we know over the past six years, emerging markets forced to invest their reserves in large liquid debt markets kept financing deficits in large developed countries, the holdings of U.S. sovereign debt by Brazil, Russia, India, and China almost doubled from one trillion in 2008 to today in about, I think it's close to $1.8 trillion. Why is international monetary system neither preventing currency volatility nor fostering an efficient allocation of global capital? So most currencies have fluctuated very fast in the last few years. Uh, we have seen this in commercial activity. Over time, uncoordinated competitive devaluations, for example, currency wars aimed at supporting and boosting national economic activity, which could foster from protectionism. EM foreign exchange holdings at two thirds of the total de facto reduce global demand which means they should invest in their local economy. Emerging markets end up lending cheaply to wealthier economies that need to save rather than spend. In other words, to be clear, reserve accumulation increases global imbalances. And by pushing down long-term interest rates, sows the seeds of future financial instability. A major rethinking is needed with all economies, with all governments. To ensure capital flows, trade relations, and global prosperity, the monetary system needs what we call a few internationally trusted currencies, the so-called global reserve currencies. Along these lines, so that we have a clearer understanding of how this works, these currencies facilitate the setting of prices, the payment of goods and services in global markets. The holdings by governments and institutions of foreign exchange reserves, um, the denomination of balance sheets for both the public and the private sector and the private actors, and finally, the accumulation of savings and central bank reserves. Is the global economy in the middle of a lost decade? This is sad to, 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 to answer, but that once again, the, the answer is yes. We are already seven years into the 2008 crisis where the world still faces below potential growth prospects, low investments, aging populations, and stagnant wages which have weakened the aggregate demand. In absence of a significant productivity boost, 
led by, let's call it innovation, global growth is likely to languish below potential for a few more years, dragged down by this same deceleration in emerging markets and the European chronic shortcomings.